Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start by first of all thanking my dear friend, Mr. Narendra Mohanji, Director NSI Kanpur. And as he mentioned, our association goes back since the days I was working in the government. And I used to regularly take advice from him on the SDF matters, on sugar policy, which I continue doing so today. And thanks a lot for the kind words, sir. Let me also, on behalf of the Indian Sugar Mills Association, thank Mr. Avasti, the president of STAI, for inviting me to deliver a very important lecture, a very prestigious lecture, Gundu Rao Memorial Lecture. I've been hearing about it for, since the time I joined uh, the industry. And uh, today I got an opportunity to really deliver a lecture in this very prestigious uh, memorial lecture of STAI. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and also giving me an opportunity to talk about the policies. That's, that's my forte. That's something that I've been doing for the last so many years. Uh, five years I was in the government uh, in the Ministry of Food where I handled sugar policy, sugar cane policy, the sugar development fund and now eight years here in ISMA from the other side of the table. So I've seen a lot on the policy advocacy and policy formulations. What I'll try and do today uh, is talk about the policies and controls that we have on the sugar sector. Also talk about the policies that the government has adopted in the past to take care of the mismatch between the demand and supply of sugar. What have been the implications? Have the policies been good for the sugar industry? Has it helped us to grow? Or it has been deterrent on the efficiencies or it has not allowed innovation in the sector. I will talk about that. And in the end, I will try and suggest some policy frameworks that we think in ISMA and personally I think will be good for the industry, the farmers, the consumers, both in the short run as well as in the long run. Now, I need not talk too much on the controls prior to 2013, but just a very quick reminder to all of you that prior to 2013, there, there were two kinds of controls, one on the sugar side, the other on the sugar cane side. The sugar side included how much of sugar that we can sell every month was decided by the government. There was an obligation on each sugar mill to give earlier 70% of their production, but later it came down to 10% over a period of time of our production at a very discounted rate at about 60-65% of the market price for the public distribution system for the poor families. The sugar was compulsorily required to be packed only in jute bags. I think in 2000, uh, before 2011, I think 100% of the sugar was required to be packed only in jute bags. The government used to control the export and import through a quota system or a tariff rate on the import duty and the export duty. On the sugar cane side, I don't think much has changed. The government continues to fix a minimum distance between two sugar mills. At the the distance has changed in some states to 25 kilometers. Area is reserved in some states like north in Uttar Pradesh, the area is reserved every year. In the other parts of the country like Karnataka or Tamil Nadu, the area is reserved over five years and it is revised only if there is a necessity. Maharashtra doesn't have any cane area reservation. The government used to fix what we call is the statutory minimum price till 2009, which was replaced to include a profit element for the farmers, and it was replaced by a system called the fair and remunerative price for sugarcane. All the North Indian states fix another price called the state advice price, which is much higher to the sugarcane price. This is prior to 2013. What happened in 2013? There were two controls removed. The regulated release mechanism was removed, which meant that from 2013 onwards, each mill could decide how much quantity of sugar they wanted to sell. They could sell 100% of their production on day one. They could retain everything for a better day tomorrow. So there was more market intelligence, more systematic or commercial decisions which are allowed to the sugar mills that they could take to decide the sale time and the sale quantity. There was no levy sugar required anymore. Today also there is no levy sugar the government, whatever they require for the BPL family, for the below poverty line family. Uh, no, sorry, it's, it's for the uh, AL, AS families, uh, Antyodhya uh, scheme family. In that, 
the government continues to buy sugar a very small percentage from the market, so there is no obligation on the sugar mills. So what are the controls left on the sugar industry after 2013? All the controls which existed prior to 2013 on sugar cane continues even today. The cane area reservation, the minimum distance between two sugar mills and the most difficult because of which the industry continues to suffer even today is a fixed price for sugar cane, first by some, by the central government and then by the central government. And the government controls the export import of sugar through a tariff rate and quotas. Now, since 2013 to 2018, we had a nice little time of decontrolled environment on our sugar sales side, where we could sell whatever we wanted to, whenever we wanted to, depending on the market situation and the commercial considerations. And I'm sorry to say that unfortunately the government in June 2018, I think it was more a reaction, more a panic kind of reaction, a panic kind of policy. They have brought back what is used to be called the release mechanism under which the government today tells each and every sugar mill not to sell above a certain quantity. Now it becomes very difficult for a sugar company in a surplus sugar production time to be told you are not allowed to sell more than this quantity, especially when they have to pay a lot of arrears of the sugarcane farmers or will be facing a lot of challenges on the storage uh, of sugar in their go-downs. Another control for the first time ever, which we thought is a very good kind of uh, step by the government is fix a minimum price for sugar. And that minimum price for sugar which was introduced on I think 8th of June 2018 was that the sugar mills cannot sell their sugar below 29 rupees per kilo or 2900 rupees per quintal. Whether that is good enough or not as per our cost of production that's a separate aspect but as a policy to kind of have an objective to ensure that the sugar mills do not sell below a certain level so that they are able to generate some margins or able to pay to the farmers. That concept is good, whether 29 is good or not, that's another aspect that we can talk separately or later. Now what has happened under the current environment? I have put it in the block letters in the end. In addition to the sugarcane price which was already being fixed by the central government, the FRP and some state governments fixing SAP. The quantity of sugar cane that we have to crush, we cannot refuse any sugar cane. The law of the country requires that all the sugar cane grown in our area has to be crushed. So the quantum of sugar cane as well as the area is also decided by the government. So the price of sugar cane is decided. The quantum of sugar cane that we have to take is also decided by the government. Now what has happened with a minimum price for sugar, the price at which we can sell, at least the minimum price at which we can sell is also decided by the government. And lastly, and most importantly I think, how much of sugar or not more than how much of sugar we can sell is also being decided by the government. So from all these sides, now we see that there is probably no scope or no reason for any of you sitting here today, a technologist's main job is to innovate, a technologist's main incentive is to bring efficiencies in the sugar mill so that you produce better quality sugar, so that you can find a market easier, you can compete better, or you develop efficiencies so that your cost is lower. But if the government tells you or gives a share to each and every sugar mill, that irrespective of the quality of sugar that you produce, irrespective of your efficiencies, you are a good sugar company or a sugar mill, you are a bad sugar mill, you don't produce a very good product, yet you are assured of a market share, irrespective of whatever happens. So where is the incentive to improve efficiencies? I don't know whether you will continue to improve efficiencies 
you will continue to develop new products, you will continue to develop products or a branded product of sugar or more refined sugar, especially when you go going to produce sugar at a higher price but the government doesn't allow you to sell, then I do not know whether this policy of regulated release mechanism is going to be good in the long run for the sugar industry to improve efficiencies or develop your product quality or develop market strategies or market networks to compete or outcompete your neighbors. Now, I will run through some of the graphs just to give you an idea what are the implications of these government controls. First of all, sugarcane price. I have only plotted the FRP, I have removed the SMP because that was prior to 2009. So you see the graph. Between 2011-12 to 2013-14, you see the jump in the FRP. There's a steep jump from 145 to 210. Now, was it justified in those years? Were you getting a price of sugar which justified that kind of increase? Then again, if you see from 2016 to what we are paying this year in 2000. 17, 18, there's again a very steep increase from 230 to 255. Then again, for the next season, there is again a steep increase, but that steep increase is also associated with an increase in the sugar recovery. So net impact will be not as huge. Now, what has the FRP fixation by the government done to the industry? You are aware that 75% of your cost of production or 70 to 75% of your cost of production is basically the cost of sugar cane. If that is going to go up in that manner, then obviously your costs are going to be very high. And I'll show you some slides later, where you will see how India has become uncompetitive in the world market. Now, in the bottom, I have mentioned two things. Number one, in this season, in the next season, that is 2018-19, which is going to start from 1st October, where the government has fixed the FRP as 275 at 10% recovery. And if we are expecting a 10.8% all India average recovery, the average FRP that we will be paying at an all India basis will be 297 per quintal of sugarcane, which is as per CACP's calculation, 92% above the A2 plus FL cost. Now A2 plus FL cost, some of you would be knowing, is the cost of production of sugarcane that the farmer spends plus an imputed value for the family labor. So almost everything is included in this. The Honorable Prime Minister did make an announcement that for all crops, the return to the farmers will be given at 50% above the A2 plus FL cost. We are already at 92% above the A2 plus FL cost. And I'll show you in the next slide how there is a distortion in the crop economics. Now. Another fact that we need to note, that due to some excellent work done by, I think most of you sitting here, is on the sugar cane side, which has helped increase the yield of sugar cane. And the yield of sugar cane in the last two years alone, I have not taken the last year because last year was a drought, so I have taken the year previous to that. So if I compare, I see that there has been a better yield to the farmers by 25% in the last two years alone. Now, has that got translated into a lower FRP or a controlled FRP? No. The farmer's cost of production of sugar cane calculated by CACP, our understanding is they have not taken the increase in the yield in their account because of which the increase in FRP is still steep. Now, as I mentioned, I have done a comparison of the FRP of sugarcane with two competing crops. One, paddy, and the other is wheat. If you see, from 2019 to 2018-19, the MSP for wheat and paddy are the lower two, and the FRP for sugarcane is the above one. So you see the gap. Till about 2012-13, the gap between the FRP of sugarcane and the MSP of the other crops, the competing crops, if I may say so, was not much. But that gap has widened. 
and in the last two years it has widened further. So despite the fact that the government might be giving a 50% higher price to the other crops over the A2 plus FL cost, the increase in sugarcane which is at 92% is so high that the farmers are getting a much higher remuneration from sugarcane and therefore we have seen that the previous uh, infamous sugar production cycle has not visited the sugar industry for the last eight years. Despite the fact our, that our farmers are not getting the payment of sugar cane on time, there is a large area at the current time, I believe it should be about 16,000 crore of area, which we probably had never imagined at this time of the season. The farmers have still grown more sugar cane and there is an 8% increase in the all India have, um, uh, acreage of sugar cane for next season. So therefore, the return to the farmer and we did a calculation of the return to the farmer from sugar cane as compared to wheat, paddy, soya, cotton and we found out that the return that a farmer gets from sugar cane is about 50 to 70 percent more than any competing crop. And therefore, if a farmer gets two-third of his payment on time and he gets one-third payment later after six months or eight months, he has already got what he would have got from another competing crop. So why should a farmer leave? A, a sugarcane farmer or a farmer is so poor that the basic reason why he decides to put a particular crop is the return that he's going to get. And therefore, this anomaly between the return from sugarcane and the other crops needs to be corrected sooner than later. Otherwise, we will continue to have the surplus sugarcane that we are having now or will have in the near future. Now, there's another important fact I needed to share with you. Even though the government fixes an MSP for 23 crops, including sugarcane, the farmer who grows sugar cane is the best placed as far as the returns, not only the returns are concerned, but also the price as well as an assured buyer. When a farmer grows wheat or paddy or cotton or soya, he has to find a buyer for his product, for his produce. He has to look for a buyer who is going to give him that assured price of MSP fixed by the government. If the weather is slightly different or not as per expectation, he might lose his crop, he might lose half his crop. But sugarcane is a sturdier crop. So clearly, a sugarcane farmer has four advantages over another crop. He has an assured buyer, he has a sugar mill who has to buy all the sugarcane that he grows. So he has an assured buyer even if there is a surplus, which is not the case in other crops. The farmer who grows sugar cane gets the price that he has been promised by the government, the FRP. I don't think there will be any single unit in the country, any single sugar mill, which can afford to pay any price below the FRP. But that is not the case in other crops. Wheat and paddy is taken by the government, but after it is taken by the government, whatever goes into the market, we are not sure whether he gets the MSP. We know the Madhya Pradesh government had brought in the Bhavantar Yugtan Bhuktan Yojana under which they said that if the farmer doesn't get the MSP and he gets much lower from the market, they will pay that difference. That is an acceptance of the fact that the, that the uh, farmer doesn't get the MSP uh, that has been promised. Sugarcane is the sturdier crop. Slight changes in the rainfall or a lower rainfall or a temperature difference doesn't make so much difference to the sugarcane as compared to the other crops. And the farmers get a much better return. So all these four factors, as well as the recent help that the sugar industry along with the farmers has given, is better yield and better recovery and better crops, better cane, cane varieties. Now at the bottom, I have taken something out from the CACP's report. In the report of CACP for 2018-19 sugar season, the CACP itself has stated that net return of sugar cane is about, will be about 245% higher than the return from paddy and wheat put together and 252% higher than cotton and wheat put together. This is not something that we have developed or we have calculated. The CACP, 
a government organization has made submissions in their report where they have recommended the FRP of 275 at 10%. So they, the acceptance is right there that there is a big distortion in the sugar cane versus the other crops already at the farm level. Now a comparison, the green line shows the FRP and the yellow or orange, whatever that color is, uh, the red reddish line shows the sugar cane, X mill all India average sugar price in the last, since 2009-10. Now whereas the sugar, uh, the sugar cane price had been obviously continuously increasing, cannot be brought down once they have fixed at a certain level, the sugar prices have not kept pace. And that is why if you see the big fall, there was, the, there was a big fall in 2014-15, there is again a big fall in the sugar, cane, sugar price now. So the sugar prices are not keeping pace with the increase in sugar price, which is why we are facing a lot of problems. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I have done a comparison of the yield, the productivity per hectare for three states, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra and Karnataka. The yellow one is the yield two years back, the blue one is last year and this is the current season that is 1718. If you see in all the three states as well as, as an all India level, there is an increase, a substantial increase of about 25% or more in the productivity of sugarcane and therefore the farmers are much better than what they were earlier. But unfortunately, we do not think that this has been taken into account by the CACP while fixing the FRP. Now what it has also done, the government policies favoring sugarcane too much has resulted in a big increase in the sugar cane acreage. The area is the blue one, and if you see that the area from 2011-12 to 2015-16 was broadly similar, except for the last two seasons where there was a drought in the western part and the southern part of the country, it fell. But this year it is back, the next year it is expected to be back at what it was earlier in the last, um, in between 2012-13 and 2015-16. But the red line, which shows the sugar cane production, if you see that the sugar cane area is almost similar to what it was previously expected next year, you see the sugar cane production jumping, jumping substantially thanks to the productivity increase. And that is the basic problem. Even though the sugar cane acreage is not increasing, the sugar cane yield has dramatically increased and has resulted in a massive increase in sugar cane production in the country. I remember when I was in the government and we used to talk and we used to talk to the industry, we used to tell them, please help the farmers increase the productivities, please bring new varieties. That is exactly what has happened. But this fact is still not being accepted, recognized or appreciated by the government in terms of policy making, in terms of fixing the price of sugar cane or fixing the price of sugar at the minimum of 29 rupees. Now, as I mentioned, the old times when we used to see two to three years of surplus production and, then fall, and followed by two to three years of low production, which happened till about 2009-10. And I used to, I still say that used to be the cycle used to automatically correct the surplus sugar. Two years of surplus and two years of low production meant that the surplus sugar used to get absorbed within the domestic market. And so in the five years, we used to balance that surplus sugar production. But if you see from 2009-10, the, the red line shows the sugar consumption or the sugar sales by the sugar mills. So from 2009-10 onwards till 2015-16, the green bars have always been, that is the sugar production have always been above the sugar consumption. So the, 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 the time of the uh, sugar cycle is gone. We have not seen the sugar cycle revisiting us again. 2016-17, we all know was a drought year. So unless there is a weather issue, we expect that we will continue to produce more and more sugar. But what, let's see what is happening this year. There's a huge jump. We have never ever crossed 30 million tons. That was our desire, but we have produced 32.3 million tons, but the consumption has been at about 25.5 million tons. 
Next year is, is going to be even much, much more difficult. We have, I don't think we have seen the worst yet. This year has been extremely bad for us, but next year, I'm sorry to say, will be extremely difficult, and I will show you what exactly it means. Next year, when we are going to produce 35.5 million tons of sugar, with a carry forward of almost about 10 to 10.5 million tons, is going to be nightmare for all of us to keep that, of sh that kind of sugar in our go-downs and find a market in the domestic market. Now, as I mentioned, I, would, I needed to also tell you that government has been supporting the industry in such times where there was surplus production or lower production. Through buffer stock, we all know what buffer stock was or is. Through reimbursement of internal transport or ocean freight charges for export, some kind of a subsidy used to be there. Government also allowed us to import some sugar under the advance authorization scheme. Then when there was a premium on exports in 2010, 11, 11, 12, the government fixed tranches so that everybody gets a share of that premium. In 2013, 14, when there was surplus sugar, the government also came forward with a new scheme as some kind of an incentive or subsidy on the market and marketing and promotion services. And we all know that loans have also been given by the government at discounted interest rates or interest-free loans to pay to the farmers. Recent policies have been good by the government. 2015-16, to tackle the surplus, the government has fixed individual quota for each and every sugar mill so that each and every sugar mill participates in the loss-making export program. And they have also tried to help the sugar mills by compensating on the FRP side by giving what is called is the production subsidy on sugar cane so that if, they, if a part of the FRP is paid by the government, some part of the export loss gets compensated from there indirectly. Last year there was a drought and the government decided to import but they were very sensible, very, very cautious and that has ensured that the, that the industry doesn't fall into too much of a problem by importing just about 7 to 8 lakh tons, 700 to 800,000 tons in the last year when there was a shortage and deficit in some area. But for the first time, they did not open imports just like that to come any, in any part of the country. They said, okay, the deficit is in the southern part, so they said, okay, the sugar will come only from certain ports in the southern part of the country. That, that was a new beautiful policy brought in in 1617. This year, again, the government has brought in a 20 lakh tons of export strategy and individual quotas have been given. There has been a production subsidy given. But against this 20 lakh tons, only 4 lakh tons have gone out. There is something which is missing in the policy. We have submitted. There is something which needs to be tweaked in that export policy so that we are all encouraged to export in a loss-making program. So that is the recent policy that the government has brought in. Just an exposure to you. Now, Quite importantly, what have been the negative impacts of the controls and policies on the sugar sector? First and foremost, as you have already shown, the green bars are the recent surplus sugar production. The red one is the line of the ex-mill sugar prices. Obviously, when the production is high, the ex-mill prices have dropped. And we all know that the ex-mill prices have fallen to such unremunerative levels that the cane price areas have really mounted. I've just done three years. As on 30th June, in 15, 16, and 16, 17, the cane price areas of farmers were just below 5,000 crore. But this year, it has gone up to 18,512 crore. Massive, almost about four times increase. If I go back slightly to the middle of May 2018, it had touched 23,000 crore. So the cane price areas are a direct result of, I would say, some of the policies adopted by the government in terms of the sugar cane price, surplus sugar production, and not, I mean, say, if I may say, the policies are not tuned in a way to kind of encourage exports. Now, a comparison of the sugar cane price that we pay that's the last one. You can see it is the biggest bar as compared to the sugarcane price that Australia, Brazil, or Thailand pay. I have converted that into rupees per ton for comparison purpose. These are the three largest exporters of sugar. 
will determine the global prices. So Thailand, Brazil and Australia are at least 30 to 40 percent lower. The cane prices there are lower 30 to 40 percent as compared to what we pay in India. Now a comparison of the cost of production of sugar with the global prices. How Indian sugar is uncompetitive, a direct result of the high cost of sugar cane results in a very high cost of production of sugar. The left graph, the blue bars show the cost of production. It went up in 1617 because uh, there was drought and the cost of production in certain parts of the country were higher. That is why we have accounted for that there. But if you see the line graph, the the uh, orange or the yellow line, that shows the global prices. That is the price at which we could have exported. That is the price that we would have got at our mill gate. So the blue bars clearly show that the cost of production of sugar is substantially higher to the export price that we get at our mill gate. So how do we export sugar? Last five years, we were clearly uncompetitive in the global market because of which we are unable to export. Now, a comparison, the right side graph, the cost of production of sugar in India versus the cost of production of sugar in Brazil, the largest exporter or the largest producer of sugar in the world. So you can see in terms of US dollars per ton, in 1718, the current season, our cost of production is about $515 per ton. And the cost of production of Brazil is just about $345 per ton. So more than $160, around $160 more than Brazil. How do you compete? How do you sell your sugar in the world market, especially when you're continuously producing surplus sugar? Now this is just, uh, the green bar shows the uh, production in that year, and the yellow one shows the carry forward sugar inventory. Now 1819, the last one, we are expecting a production of 35.5 million tons, but a carry forward as huge as 10.2 million tons. So if we are going to domestically consume 25 and a half, and not able to export because we are uncompetitive in the global market, we will be closing next season with 19 million tons, 190 lakh tons. The closing balance sugar inventory is the fourth from top. It is equivalent to nine months consumption requirement. I am sure you must have already discussed within your sugar mills in your companies back home, how will you keep the sugar in your go-downs. I'm sure you would be constructing a lot of temporary go-downs. But despite that, I'm told, a lot of discussions I've had with a lot of colleagues and friends here, they've said they're looking at for go-downs outside the factory to keep some of the surplus sugar. So that is the kind of problem that we are going to face next year. 19 million tons at an all India level and everywhere there is surplus production. And it's going to block something like 60,000 crore of funds or working capital in this inventory. As I mentioned, 2018-19 is going to be even more difficult. Extremely difficult, I have said there. Cane crushing. To produce 35.5 million tons of sugar at about 10.8% recovery, the kind of sugar cane that we will be crushing next season is 325 million tons of sugar cane. 325 million tons of sugar cane FRP of 297, if you do simple mathematics, you will come to a result of a total FRP payable in 2018-19 of 96,500 crore. If I add the SAP, then the next year's cane price payment is going to cross 1 lakh crore. We used to talk about 65,000 or 70,000 two years back. Now, if you talk about 260 lakh tons of domestic sale next year, and if the government's policy of fixing a minimum X mill price of 29 continues, because of which we get an average price of 3,000 rupees per quintal in the whole of next season, 
in the whole of 12 months of next season from october to september the total revenue realization 260 into 3000 simple mathematics takes you to 78000 crore but the most important thing to note is you will be buying all the sugar cane by probably end of april or by the middle of may when we will be able to sell just about 150 lakh tons of sugar and not 260 lakh tons of sugar so if 30 rupees multiplied by 150 lakh tons of sugar is considered we will be getting a revenue of just about 45000 crore so only 45000 crore versus a cane price payable of 96500 crore or 1 lakh crore if you calculate the sap the cane price arrears look massive i don't know how much of this will get cleared from the working capital but the situation or the uh, problem next year is going to be massive unless we are going to supplement some of that revenue realization to uh, through exports therefore exports are necessary from two point of view one reduction in the inventory that each sugar mill holds and it's not going to happen that north indian sugar mills will buy sugar from the southern or western part and uh, export their quota they will have to probably move their own sugar because you will going to be having so much of inventory in your in your uh, sugar mills if i add the carry forward cane price areas of the current season that is going to make things even worse so what is the solution that we are looking at for the next season we have requested the government and that is something that we believe is should not be a problem unless there is a political issue on the on the consumer front we have said instead of keeping the x mill minimum price at 2900 rupees per quintal increase it to 3600 rupees per quintal you want to have two prices for different regions have two prices of minimum sugar so that everybody gets a chance to sell you want to have one price you find a way how that how everybody is going to compete in the same market so we have said that our cost of production of sugar next season is going to be around 3600 if you put the rangarajan committee formula also and calculate at 275 10% recovery of frp you will arrive at a number more than 3600 as the price of sugar to justify that frp so we have said increase it from 2900 to 3600 and 80% of the sugar that we are going to sell in the domestic market will be at 3600 so you are going to collect that kind of revenue for 80% of your sugar and supplement the revenue by way of exports but make it compulsory because without making it compulsory half of us export and the other half don't and the first half feel cheated so make it compulsory and ensure that all 60 to 70 lakh tons which happens to be 20% of our production is exported compulsory if you don't export that quantity of sugar will get seized by the government and government will export through its own agency so if the government fixes 36 as the minimum price and we sell 80% and the balance we export at 20 rupees 18 rupees or whatever we get next year the average x mill price realization including the loss will work out to about 32 or 33 rupees at the mill gate which is not meaning that you are going to make abnormal profits or you are going to i mean run away with a lot of money no it's going to only ensure that the sugar mill survive as well as the farmers get their payment on time today you have a problem of negative cash flow because there is a subsidy from the government and we are saying that if you make this 3600 rupees don't give us a subsidy we are going to export our at our own losses otherwise with a the subsidy there is a problem of wto there is a time gap between the date you export and the time you get the repayment from the government in terms of the export subsidy or whatever help that the government gives so what we have said is a simple formula minimum price of 36 and compulsory export of the balance 20% without subsidy this we believe will help us wade through the problem next year still the closing balance will still remain at about 12 million or 12 and a half million next after the next year even if we export about 6 to 7 million now there is a concern as i mentioned that the government might feel that the retail prices will jump now what we have done we have plotted from 2000 july, july 2015 month wise 
X mill prices, all India average X mill price, which is the blue one, the lower one, and the retail prices, which we have picked up from the Ministry of Consumer Affairs website. So even if you see that in the last season, when we collected an X mill price of about 37 rupees average, 36 to 37 rupees, the retail prices remained at 42 to 44 rupees or 43 and a half rupees in that range. And please remember, it was a shortage year. When we did not have enough sugar to take care of our demand, it was a shortage year and yet the retail prices were at about 42 to 43 and a half. In a surplus year, which we are going to have next season, if the X mill prices are brought back to 36 rupees, which we got last year, we do not expect the retail prices to cross 42 or 43. So where is the concern about the consumers? Where is the political issue? Where is the problem of inflation? It's not there. Secondly, and quite importantly, we remember the government was also looking to bring in a cess on sugar of 3 rupees. There was a recommendation which went to the GST council. There was deliberation. Still not accepted. We don't know whether it's going to be accepted. So if that 3 rupees of cess was brought in, it would have resulted in the same thing. Now that we don't want any subsidy, you did not put any cess, and therefore the prices will remain at the same level, even if you had brought in a cess. Now, from some difficult aspects of sugar, I just want to talk about ethanol because ethanol we know is being looked at as a long-term strategy to reduce the surplus sugar, to balance the surplus sugar production. The whole idea of the government today with the ethanol procurement policy or the ethanol pricing policy has been to incentivize the sugar industry or incentivize the ethanol producer to produce more and more ethanol. We are currently producing all the ethanol only from B heavy molasses. The government has changed their policy. They have brought in a new biofuel policy recently where they have not only allowed B heavy molasses conversion into sugar, it had, they have also allowed conversion of sugar cane juice into sugar. They have also allowed conversion of broken and rotten grains and potatoes into sugar. So therefore, there is a direct incentive from the government as far as policy is concerned, as well as a very important thing that they have done in the pricing policy. Now, let us look at number one, why should we divert surplus sugar into ethanol? Do we get enough remuneration? Are we compensated for the loss of revenue that we get from sugar by diverting that sugar into ethanol? And do we have a policy where we are sure that whatever surplus ethanol that we produce will be taken by the government? Unless there is a clear demand, unless there is a clear stable policy guaranteeing that, look here, you will not get less than this price, I don't think we are going to invest in capacities because this requires a lot of investment to be brought in over the next three, four, five years. First of all, the OMCs for the last three years have continuously asked for supplies of ethanol to blend at 10% which we have been giving from B C heavy molasses. In the current season, we will probably be giving something like 160 crore liters, which is just about half of the requirement of the oil company. So there is clearly an unmet demand of 160 crore liters. And if we are going to divert some of the B heavy molasses or, uh, or some of the sugar cane juice, if we can, then probably about two and a half million tons or 25 lakh tons of surplus sugar can straight away go into ethanol. It can reduce your surplus sugar production. It can give you the extra cash flows that you require. There's a clear cut buying there. You don't have to wait or keep the inventory for a long time. Unfortunately, even if we have a clear demand, there is a very good sugar cane pricing policy. There is enough feedstock with us because we have so much of B-heavy molasses or so much of sugar that we are ready to divert that. So what is missing? The missing point is the capacity. 
Today, the total capacity that we have in the country, distillation capacity to produce ethanol, is 275 crore liters, including the capacity with the standalone distilleries in the country. Another about 25 crore liters is going to be added in the next 12 months. Probably some of that will come on stream probably sometime in October or November. So there is investment from the industry already in developing more and more capacity. So next year we should be about 300 crore liters of capacity next season. Now, why should we convert the B-heavy molasses if we do not get enough price? The government has already come out with a dual pricing for ethanol for the first time in the history of the Indian sugar or Indian ethanol industry. I am not sure whether we have a similar dual pricing policy anywhere in the world. I, I, I stand to be corrected if somebody has a dual pricing. But the government has come out with a beautiful policy in which they say that if you are going to produce ethanol from CAV molasses, from your final molasses, your price of ethanol will be 43 point something. But if you're going to divert some of your B-heavy molasses and produce some ethanol from that B-heavy molasses, we will give you a premium, premium of almost about three and a half or four rupees. We have done our calculations and we believe that at the current price of ethanol made from B-heavy molasses, you will get around compensation for around 29 rupees, 29 and a half rupees of sugar. So, if your minimum sugar prices remain at 29 or 30, it makes sense not only to produce ethanol from B-heavy molasses, which is going to give you immediate demand, immediate take, uh, offtake by the oil companies and cash flows, but also reduction in the surplus inventory that you're going to have. And on a long-term basis, this is a beautiful policy, which is, if I may permitted to say, which may be similar to what the Brazilians do when the price of ethanol is good, they divert some of the surplus sugar into ethanol. And that is why we are saying that probably next year, India is going to be the largest sugar producer in the world because if we produce about 35 million tons next year and Brazilians produce 29 million tons by diverting a lot of sugar into or sugar cane into ethanol, obviously we are also looking at a similar strategy. Now the government again has beautifully come out with a beautiful program saying that if you want to set up ethanol production capacities, we will give you subsidized loans at about 6% rate of interest. I am told by some of you only, some technologists yourself, that the rate of return on an ethanol production capacity is around 7% or 7.5% internal rate of return per year. And therefore, if your interest burden is about 6%, it does make sense because the other policies, the pricing policy are all very good. The government has also said that the ethanol pricing policy in future will be linked to the FRP of sugar cane, which clearly means that the price of ethanol is not going to come down. It is only going to go up or remain stable. Now concluding, what I wanted to say is immediate policies. I have talked that about that in detail to tackle up the massive surplus sugar inventory that we are going to have now as well as next year. The policy framework that the government brings in should serve two purposes and not just one. It has to ensure that the surplus sugar inventory in the country moves out. Otherwise, I don't know if there is another surplus production in 1920, what's going to happen. So surplus inventory needs to be moved out, number one, and at the same time, we should get enough revenue realization to be able to pay to the farmers on time. So with these two objectives, the policies should be framed accordingly. Long-term policy framework, this is a long-term demand from our side, rationalize the sugarcane pricing policy, the system of increasing the FRP without any recognition of the revenue realization of sugar mills is not going to work. Because number one, we have already distorted the farm economics by making sugarcane much, much more remunerative as compared to other crops. And number two, we are making the sugar industry unviable, the Indian sugar mills unviable in, in the international market. Because we are going to be a surplus sugar producer unless there is a weather issue. We have structurally become a surplus sugar producer and an exporter, and therefore our policies should be framed in such a manner 
to make the Indian sugar competitive world over. We have to find a way to discover our future prizes to allow us to hedge or take long-term decisions. And lastly, the ethanol procurement and pricing policy and blending policy should be framed and already framed to draw the surplus sugar cane into ethanol. That is all I had to say. I, I hope I have not put many of you to sleep because I don't know whether it was an interesting uh, topic to talk about the Indian sugar policy, but I thought as technologists, you should know uh, how the efforts that you're making or the innovations that you're doing or the efficiencies that you're bringing in are actually getting translated or incentivized through the policy making by the government. Thank you.